Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming along. Uh, I'm going to basically give a, a kind of praise to my work um, over the last uh, 14 years, predominantly looking at the projects I've been doing since 2006, um, starting with uh, 2004, sorry, starting with Motherland, and then just kind of giving you a, a kind of snapshot, really, of the, of the main pieces of work that I've been doing since then, um, to give you a kind of overview of, of, of uh, kind of what, what I do, if you like. Um, I, I'll start with this picture. Um, I actually uh, studied human geography at Sheffield University. So I didn't uh, study uh, f photography initially. I did do some photography at school. But when it came to university, I decided I wanted to kind of get a grounding um, in a kind of, uh, in a different subject, if you like. And it was partly because my parents also thought that photography was a bit of a Mickey Mouse degree. So um, we kind of met halfway and did geography, which some people still think it's a bit of a Mickey Mouse degree. Um, but actually, I have to say, on a serious note, it has been an important kind of grounding point in terms of ideas that I've used through my own photography, particularly looking at ideas of landscape, representation, ideas of uh, identity, and echoes of kind of uh, economics and politics taking place within a, a, the built environment. Um, the reason I show you this picture is that after graduating, I um, began, uh, I, I studied a very short photojournalism course at Sheffield College, the National Council for the Training, Training of Journalists, and began uh, a very, very short period working as a news photographer in Sheffield, which uh, was, was a very uh, painful experience. But when I, while I was in Sheffield, I decided to make a, make a series of photographs for my own. So although I was working for this particular agency, I did a story about a, a young boxer uh, who trained with Prince Nazim. And of course, it, you know, we've seen a lot of these black and white <coughs> boxing stories, but the particular story I did was on the fact that this kid also tap danced, and he tap danced to try and improve the speed and agility on his feet uh, so that he'd be, be a kind of performer in the ring. So it was a kind of twist on the, you know, the, the, the usual boxing story. Anyway, that, that particular series won the Ian Parry Award uh, in, two, in 1998, 1998, 1997. Um, which is uh, related to the Sunday Times magazine. And by winning that award, the Sunday Times magazine gives you a commission of, to do anything that you want to do uh, on behalf of the magazine. So I pitched this idea uh, about the snowbirds. And this was a story that was directly related to a uh, population geography class that I did. Uh, we, learned, we, we did a study about the temporary movement of people in particular areas. And this was the snowbirds is a, is a particularly well-known one in America where elderly Americans move from the northern states of Idaho, Montana in winter. And they follow the kind of migrationary route of birds. And they travel south, where it's much warmer. And they spend three or four months living in the warmer climates. And then they head back to their to their normal home. So I, I went and I spent um, a few weeks photographing uh, in this particular town called Quartzsite, which was then subsequently published uh, in the Sunday Times magazine. Um, the particular town that I photographed had a population of 6,000 people, uh, but for three months of the year, half a million elderly people turn up in motorhomes. So that picture on the top left is normally empty desert. Um, and then you have uh, tens of thousands of these motorhomes, or RVs as the Americans call them, turn up and pitch, and they basically live this kind of temporary existence. And what I liked about this story was that it kind of played on the idea of retirement, our expectations of what it means to be retired. Um, as they describe themselves, they are spending the kids' inheritance, um, and they're kind of off for a good time. So the picture on the top right was a singles night, and I kind of like that kind of Marilyn Monroe-esque character. Um, so this was, um, I traveled with that lady there uh, in, the, in the middle, Penny Cheney. I, I met her in Idaho. So I flew to Idaho and then traveled down to Quartzsite in Arizona with her and then um, basically photographed her and her friends um, in the desert. So this published in 1998. Um, and then often what I was doing as a, in my early career was I very much see ideas as, as an important currency to my photography. And, and particularly, it's particularly important in terms of working as a magazine photographer. Everybody's really interested in coming up with you know, uh, something different or a new way of photographing. And I found it quite important that I came up with a lot of ideas. So I was often pitching ideas to magazines in those early years to try and get, to try and get work. Um, and also, when I was photographing a story like this one, I'd always be trying to work out whether there was another story that I could do on the back of this. So I was always trying to you know, find kind of new routes and, and new ideas. And one of the ones that I did here was that uh, one of these old boys invited me into his motorhome and uh, started showing me some pictures 
um, of his grandkids and holiday snaps. And then he showed me a photograph of this, which is uh, Desert Blast, which was an an annual gathering of pyromaniacs in the Nevada desert. And when I saw that picture, I, I said, right, I have to come, I have to come and photograph that. And uh, it took me six months to persuade the organisers um, because it had never been photographed by a professional. It was basically a clandestine gathering of uh, people who like blowing shit up, is, is, is the way they describe themselves. Um, and this was... Um, so finally I got permission to photograph it and I, I called the Sunny Times picture desk and they agreed to give me uh, travel to America. They, they didn't fully commission it, but they gave me travel. So I flew to um, Las Vegas and then spent 24 hours in the Nevada desert photographing these strange characters. Um, this guy is called Wally, Gren, uh, Wally Glenn. Uh, he uh, goes by the name of Pyro Boy and he attaches fireworks to his body and does a dance to Jimi Hendrix's Star Spangled Banner. Um, I'm, I'm quite a long way away on a, on a long lens. Um, and, you know, what the, the main stipulation was that I didn't show anybody's identity. So most of the photographs you can't see anybody. And um, it was quite an extraordinary event. And I photographed, uh, I think, about 85 rolls of film in 24 hours. I mean, this was before pre-digital days. Um, and one of the things I learned very early on as a news photographer, and this particular agency I was working in, is they had copyright on my material. And that basically meant that they were able to syndicate my work and make a living or um, make additional revenue from, from resales. Um, and I, as soon as I, I left the news kind of field, I have been fiercely independent in terms of controlling my own archive and controlling copyright. So for instance, this particular commission, the Sunday Times magazine basically got licensed first usage. So when they published these pictures, I was then able to uh, syndicate these pictures. And uh, they've, they've published in, in uh, countless magazines around the world um, and have, and at the time, proved an important kind of currency in terms of uh, funding continued work. Um, I'm only going to show very just a couple of those spreadsheets because really what I wanted to get onto was the work that I've been producing um, since 2004. So as I said, between 1998 and 2003, I was working predominantly in, within magazine environment. And I found it progressively frustrating working within that, uh, the, constra the constraints of magazines where you would have very little time and often very little budget to produce uh, a kind of definitive story on whatever you were being commissioned to do. And I wanted to really have an opportunity to explore my own photography in much more depth. And, and the only way I could do that was actually to step out of the e editorial environment, if you like, and begin working on a long-term project where I had much more freedom to, to work around one subject matter. And this was really instigated by, um, I got on the World Press Masterclass in 2003. And a lot of the, the, the masters on this course were basically picture editors, they were curators, they were um, kind of well-known photographers. And all of them basically came back with the feedback that you really need to, to try and work out what it is that you're interested in exploring. What is your voice in photography? And a lot of people talk about this idea of finding your voice. And it, of course, it can be quite challenging. But I think the first step is really giving your your, yourself the time and the space to really uh, kind of explore uh, something that you're interested in. And you know, often that, that means not necessarily getting paid to do it. Um, and so what I did was here, I decided to take a year out um, and travel across Russia. Um, well, I traveled with my wife, um, who I met at university in Sheffield, and who was a, a Russian speaker. She studied Russian. So this was an important thing, because otherwise I would probably be languishing in some Siberian jail uh, as we speak. And so we started in the far east of Russia and crisscrossed our way back to Moscow over the course of, of a year. And the reason for photographic going to Russia was that it was coming up to the 15th year since the fall of communism. Um, so I had a kind of hook if I needed it uh, in terms of trying to sell this in as a book or as, a, as an exhibition, whatever. So, you know, I had, had some time frame which I could use. I was also interested in photographically that a lot of the photographs coming out of Russia since the fall of communism had been about, had been black and white. A lot of them had been about ideas around the de de uh, deterioration, the de collapse of the end of something rather than the beginning of something. And so I felt that the photographic dialogue hadn't really moved on. So it seemed like an interesting period of time to actually try and produce uh, something different. 
what I did, what I did do before I went is I, I approached Chris Boot, who was a, a publisher, a, a photo book publisher who previously had worked uh, both at Aperture and at Magnum, um, basically to see whether he'd be, be interested in commissioning this particular uh, book or be interested in publishing it. And he was very non-committal, um, uh, and, and for obvious reasons, I was a kind of unknown young photographer who'd kind of come up with this idea and you know, didn't really have a, a, a kind of really strong framework about what, why I was going and what I was doing. Um, but he did give some very good advice, which was basically, if you're going to travel for a year, if you're going to be making pictures, it's very important that you think clearly about the way that you're going to produce this work, the photographic composition, the kind of, so that when you come back to England, you don't have this kind of plethora of eclectic photographs, that when you try to bring them together as something coherent, um, don't work. So really think clearly about the, the photographic methodology, if you like, behind what you're doing. And so I spent a lot of time thinking and, and, and trying different uh, ways of creating photographs before I really decided upon what I was going to do. And all of this, in the end, was shot on one camera, Mamiya 7, mostly with uh, one lens, an 85mm, which is a standard lens in terms of uh, medium format. So it's as the eye sees. Um, I wanted to, I shot um, a, a series of landscapes and portraits. So I was going to use these kind of two very different um, approaches where I was taking landscapes which were almost maps to be read. They were about the kind of in, the, the, the relationship between people and space, between uh, an interior or exterior landscape. So this is, for instance, one of, this is the first photograph I took actually. This is at Magadan Airport in Far East Russia. This is a departure lounge. And it's about what people are wearing. It's about the kind of Soviet iconography in the background. It's the architecture. It's the details of you know, the dry fish being sold in, the, in the, the little kiosk. These kind of little elements that tell you something about uh, kind of time and place. And then alongside the landscapes, I wanted to take a series of portraits which took you face to face, if you like, with the Russians. And this was very, very much inspired by August Sander, who'd made work um, in Germany in the early 20th century and published a book, a very famous book. And he'd taken this, I took a very similar approach in terms of taking quite deadpan portraits, stopping people, having them basically stand in front of the, the camera and, and, and look directly at me, but also at you, the viewer. Um, and what I did with these is that I had very little interaction with the people I was photographing before I took the picture. I wanted to kind of strip away most of the emotion. I didn't really, I just wanted to make very simple uh, structured pictures. And then afterwards we'd interview them, or my wife would interview them, um, because I wanted to get information that would then form text and a kind of a context, if you like, to the photograph, which would then be used in the book if a book ever um, materialized. So for instance, this was two twins um, that I found at a bus stop in Magadan. I've actually placed them, uh, they were stood at the side. I've, I've used the bus stop as a kind of uh, a street, um, what's the word, studio. Um, but they've decided to hold hands. They've, they've, they've taken on this particular pose. Um, themselves. And, and what I like about this is the details of the fact they're holding hands, there's uh, you know, these kind of fake leather jackets, the advertising on the plastic bag, um, the handbag, these little elements that tell you something about uh, this couple. And then also I took a few pictures which were kind of almost autobiographical. They were a bit much more about this idea of the journey. They were about you know, me making this, this particular work, um, and the idea of the road trip, because ostensibly this was a, a, a road trip across uh, uh, this country. And this was a photograph of the first hotel bedroom I stayed in in Magadan, and I just loved the interior design, which, which almost works. And it was very important that this work, that a lot of the, the trip wasn't planned. I was very aware about my position as a white, middle-class, Western photographer going out to photograph this exotic other place. And I wanted to challenge, wherever possible, my own preconceptions of Russia and, and a, a kind of a lot of the photographs that I'd seen and I'd grown up with in, my, um, in the past, you know, thinking about a particular aesthetic, a particular way of looking at, at the Russian landscape or the Russian people. And so a lot of the things that we did were very much um, kind of ad hoc. So for instance, this is a, a photograph we took on a, 
Hopper I took while we were on a, a horse track through Kamchatka, which is a volcanic peninsula in Far East Russia. And we met these two guys and they offered to take us on this trip and we traveled with them. And so I was able to kind of produce these more uh, kind of personal photographs, if you like, which, which weren't part of a prescribed journey that the Lonely Planet guide had necessarily told me to go on or, uh, you know, they were, they were challenging kind of things that I uh, was thinking about photographing beforehand. And the work really became about exploring these notions of re the relationship between Russia and Russian identity. And a lot of the Russians I met spoke very passionately about this idea of, of uh, their relationship to notions of Russianness. And so I wanted to try and find photographs that would explore this uh, particular idea. And for me, this is one of the pictures that is most successful, this idea that this character here, Pavel, is almost becoming part of the, the earth. He's kind of fallen and he's, he's kind of almost becoming part of the, uh, the landscape. And also playing on, on ideas of, of representations of Russian landscape in Russian art. There was a huge show of Russian landscape painting in London before we left at the, uh, I think it was, I'm sure it was at the, the RA. And a lot of the photographs had this very, uh, the paintings had this very pastel palette. They were quite melancholy. And so I wanted to, 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 to kind of nod, if you like, towards this particular uh, um, way of representing the landscape. So here we have this, uh, this is Sakhalin Island in Far East Russia. Again, this is where um, Chekhov lived in the 1890s when it was a penal colony. Um, and this, this is a, an abandoned fishing um, port with an old military landing craft. Um, and for me, a lot of these photographs are important that, it's that, that they have text with them. So in the book, this tells you that this is uh, um, the, just offshore from where this picture was taken. There are vast sums of uh, uh, gas and oil being excavated from the ground. And a lot of that kind of revenue is being uh, repatriated back to Moscow. And it's a very important part of um, Moscow's kind of geopolitical standing in the world. But of course, you can't see that because these are offshore. So, you know, here we have this idea of, on the one hand, something that looks quite decrepit, but actually, in terms of a landscape, this, this area is extremely important um, to, to modern Russia, which is, of course, something we're seeing more and more of now, with, particularly in Crimea, and the use of oil and gas as a, a political tool. Uh, this is uh, taken in Yakutsk in Siberia, just another example of the portraits. This guy is in the Russian military. He's uh, it's a conscript army. Uh, he's based in Vladivostok and had returned to uh, Yakutsk to, to see his pregnant fiancée. And again, it's about the details. It's the, it's the fact that he's holding the handbag and just kind of, uh, kind of like the pose that they've taken. And I'm just going to finish with this picture from the, the, the Russian series. This was uh, taken in the Ural Mountains in um, a place called... Um, where was it taken? Yekaterinburg. And this is uh, taken on the 9th of May, which is the most important political hol uh, holiday in Russia where they um, celebrate the uh, winning the war in, against Germany. And it's a very important public holiday. And here is just kind of people, you know, integrating with each other, you know, using the landscape. There's somebody playing the guitar, there's somebody um, drinking, there's a barbecue, there's balloons pinned to the tree. And I was very interested in this kind of use of the landscape and a very kind of Russian landscape. The silver birch is quite a, an important motif in, uh, in terms of Russian literature and, and Russian art. And the reason I show this photograph is that it's very important in terms of the way that I've started producing or I started producing work when I got back to England, using this idea of this kind of constellation of groups of people within a landscape. And also, when I blew this picture up and I put it in, 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 a, in a gallery, actually, I showed it here. Uh, it was one of the first places I showed it back in 2007. And I was interested in a particular size when you stood in front of it. You, be, you, you became part of this landscape. There was an interesting interaction. And also, there was a lot of information, a lot of narrative that you was able to, uh, to, to read, if you like, by um, looking at the details in the photograph. So I returned in 2005, having spent a year traveling across the country. I'd shot 500 rolls of film, um, so I had this huge kind of vast sum of photographs which I then had to edit. Um, I edited it down to about 500 pictures, which I then took to Chris Boot, who agreed to publish the book. Um, and that was quite a long process. It took a year, at least a year, to publish the book, and it was finally released in late 2006. 
Um, it was a print run of 5,000 copies. So along with the book, I decided I wanted to create a website to give the book a kind of wider audience, if you like. And this was the early days of Flash, and the book was made so that you, 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 know, you kind of flick through the book. So it, was, um, it seemed quite um, unique at the time, but of course now it's, uh, it's looking very uh, tired. But anyway, it was, a, it was an interesting way to engage a wider audience with the work. Um, the book was laid out uh, as, as the actual book. Um, I didn't put the whole thing online because I, was, I didn't want to uh, kill all my sales. Um, but of course, as well as representing the work online, it was also a, a useful marketing tool in terms of telling people about the work, uh, getting people to buy the book, and also uh, having people uh, putting up reviews and news about the work. So it became a kind of, uh, um, a kind of micro site, if you like, around the work. Um, but this will just give you an, uh, an idea of, of how it was laid out. It was a relatively small book because I wanted it to be um, something that you could kind of quite hold quite easily. I didn't want a big kind of unwieldy coffee table book um, for this particular um, series. And it's laid out, as I said, chronologically. And here's the text that tells you about each of the photographs. So as I said, I wanted to have that kind of context of information so that you could kind of read about what you were looking at. And I'll leave that out so people can look at it if you want to afterwards. So actually online, I took the, the text out because it was too difficult to read. Um, so it's just uh, uh, the photographs online. And here you can see the interplay between the, the way that I used uh, landscapes and portraiture. So for instance, that portrait was taken in that, uh, uh, that block of um, apartments. And the book was peppered with um, quotes and sayings from um, Russian literature about the idea of the Russian landscape. And these were sourced by the person that wrote the essay, Rosamond Bartlett, who wrote an essay about what, it, what the word Rodina means. And Rodina is the, the, the word for motherland. So it was important that there was also a context so that with the essay gave you a grounding within which to then view the photographs. And another important thing about the website is that I wanted to to create an opportunity, a forum, if you like, where people could also comment on the work. I was particularly interested in engaging with a Russian audience to give uh, you know, a Russian audience an opportunity to, to feed back, if you like, and to reflect back on the way that I had tried to, or I had represented uh, their country. And so there was an, an opportunity for, for me to kind of in, engage in this dialogue, uh, this kind of online forum. Um, and it's, the website's there to this day, so people can still comment on the work. And this idea of kind of collaborating has become a more important tool that I've then uh, engaged with uh, since uh, creating this work. So of course, one of the, one of the major things about producing a, a body of work, producing a, a book and, and then, and then uh, an exhibition was, it's always that kind of second album. What do you do next? You know, how, does, how do you then move on in terms of uh, reflecting on the work that you've done, but progressing your, your own um, kind of uh, career forwards, if you like. And Motherland was very important in terms of giving me an, an avenue for um, having more freedom to make the type of work that I wanted to make. So having uh, the book was, was reasonably successful, so I then be able to, was able to start selling uh, prints. I began working with the photographer's gallery. And so print sales became a, a, to, to, you know, a kind of way of, of being able to fund some of my work. I wouldn't say I could kind of live off them, but it certainly it was an opportunity at the time to, to give me a bit more freedom to, to, to explore my own, my own work. Um, and I decided that I wanted to um, very much reflect directly back against Motherland and create a series of work about England. I was really interested, you know, having, having been almost challenged by this idea of, of, of what it means to be English. And, you know, while I was, you know, the, the Russians had such a kind of innate sense of, of, of Russianness, and I felt quite ambivalent about what it meant to be English. And I returned to a country which was very much in the, the, the the, the midst of a, a debate about devolution, which has only escalated over the last uh, few years, as we're seeing with the, the, the independence vote. And so it seemed like an interesting time um, politically, but also photographically, to create a series uh, exploring the ideas of, of England through the English landscape. Now, um, and also when I got back, there was this big show at Tate Britain called How We Are um, Photographing Britain, which was a kind of historic overview of looking at mapping British photography 
uh, British photographers making work about Britain. And so, uh, and what was interesting about that show was that when it got to the last decade, there seems to be a kind of period in, in the 90s where um, the work became very eclectic and there wasn't, there wasn't anything, f f for my mind, that was, was particularly um, interesting as compared to some of the work that had been made previously by people like Paul Graham, Homer Sykes, John Davies, uh, Tony Ray Jones, Martin Parr, Anna Fox. Um, all the way back to people like Sir Benjamin Stone working in the uh, 1890s. And so I decided that it was actually in quite an important time in f British photography to start making work about, about Britain, or in my case, England. Um, and I think it was partly because my generation had very much grown up with a cheap flight, so we've gone abroad to make work and not really explored our own backyard. And it's actually very difficult to, you know, to make work. It's much easier in some ways to go abroad. Um, and so I was, I was placing myself in this kind of, in this lineage. But of course, by doing that, I had to be very careful that I wasn't being derivative of what had gone before. And so I wanted, I needed to think carefully about, you know, creating a framework, creating a particular visual um, um, composition or a way of recording or way of looking, if you like, at the landscape that, that made it quite unique um, to me. And so these are just some of my scrapbooks that I was using at the time to kind of explore different ideas uh, everything from Jeff Ward to uh, to Avacamp, um, and then of course you know looking at um, uh, landscape British landscape painting, um, but also kind of history painting. I was very interested in people like William Powell Frith, um, you know that were making these kind of big scenes with a lot of people in them, these kind of social landscapes, if you like. Um, and then also kind of thinking back to geography, you know, looking at um, people like John Berger that wrote in Cultural Geography about, you know, looking at ways of seeing the landscape. Uh, this is a painting that uh, several cultural geographers have written about, uh, Thomas Gainsborough's Mr. and Mrs. Andrews, and the way that, you know, we are able to, um, to try and decode, if you like, not just uh, decode landscapes. So here, this is as much about uh, it being a portrait of the landed gentry with, you know, Mr. Andrews, um, uh, you know, the kind of the landowner and the, you know, the um, Mrs. Andrews sat down and the kind of oak tree, the representation of English um, and um, kind of the f ideas of fertility. But it's also about an economic landscape. Here you've got um, very early form of uh, uh, farming methods with the, um, the Enclosures Act. So in the background you can see the way that the, the, the land has been um, privatised, if you like, and has been enclosed. And here you've got this kind of... Sh farming method, new farming method with the sheep grazing within this private land owned by Mr. Andrews, which is where most of his wealth came from. So the idea that thinking about how we look at the English landscape and how we can kind of decode it and think about different layers of meaning and what we're looking at. But then also thinking about my own relationship to England and you know, how much that was also informed by my own experiences, my own memories, if you like, of, of England. And of course, that was very much informed by ideas of you know, the leisure activities, where we went on holidays. This is um, me on the far left with my brother and dad on an August bank holiday in the Lake District, eating meat pies in the rain. So I have my, you know, my memory, my experience of England is infused with a particular type of landscape, a particular type of experience. And this time I was going to... Uh, make the work in a similar fashion. I was going to use a year, as I'd done in Russia. I wanted to give myself a strict framework in terms of time. Um, I wanted to cross all four seasons. Um, and so again, it was going to be the idea of the road trip. But this time, I was also joined by, or we were joined by our, our daughter. So there's also that idea of the kind of family experience, um, you know, me passing on an experience. Um, this time, I was going to be shooting with a plate camera, which I'll talk about, uh, I mean, a, a view camera, which I'll talk about a bit later on. So I decided I was going to make this work. I was going to go on this journey around, you know, very much this time just looking at landscape. I wasn't going to look at portraiture. I wanted to I'd look at the idea of the collective and people in landscape and how we relate to the English landscape. Um, but this time I decided to, to launch a website before I'd made the work. So the website would then become a forum where people could engage with the work. But particularly what I wanted to do is I wanted the English to suggest ideas of things that I could photograph. So there would be a direct collaboration with those that I was going out to represent. And this became quite a useful tool in terms of, um, not just in terms of generating ideas, but also generating interest, general interest in the work. So over the course of the year, I had about 450 ideas that were uploaded. Um, and you can download the PDF to this day. And so what I like about the website is that it's become this body of research which sits alongside my photographs. And so you can look at the, you know, the way that, or read about the way that people talk about the landscape. 
Um, and it was also interesting to find things that hadn't been photographed before. So it was very easy for me to go and you know, photograph the cheese raising festival or um, you know, a number of things that had been photographed before. But here I was able to engage with, with new ideas. As I said before, this was going to be a road trip. Um, I love the idea of the road trip. You know, even in terms of photography, it has a rich um, theme. You know, if we think about people like uh, Joel Sternfeld or Stephen Shaw or the Beckers, um, who've all kind of gone a journey to make work. And so here, this was my, my home and studio and photographing platform, uh, Talbot Swift Motorhome, which we travel around the country in. Um, one of the most important things about this particular motorhome was that I wanted to have an elevated perspective from which I could always photograph from. So wherever I could park the motorhome, I could use this as a way of getting above the landscape. And because these were all going to be about people in landscape, it was important that I had some elevation. I wanted to, um, to kind of echo those, that kind of afagamp, if you like, if you're thinking about those kind of small people in the landscape. I wanted to echo ideas of history painting with the elevation where actually it's often taken from a bird's eye perspective where you're, the viewer is surveying a scene. So there's also an idea of power here because you're, you're overlooking, you know, you're not you know, you're on the ground with the people, but you're kind of um, having this kind of wider tableau, if you like. Um, but also it, it, it lifts the kind of midriff of the photograph. So rather than being about just the foreground and the horizon, you also get this rich seam through the middle, which um, kind of opens itself up. And so this was the first photograph I took where I really felt I developed a particular way or, or the way that I was going to then carry on through, through the, 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 um, the rest of the work. So this was um, Skegness Beach um, in August 2007. And I just love the kind of details like the, the, uh, the guy in the full military gear, um, there's somebody swimming, you've got you know, the kids with their Adidas tracksuits, you've got people with their Tesco bags. You know, there's these, all these details that tell us something about uh, kind of people, place and time. But the work was also going to play on the ideas of uh, the green and pleasant land, you know, thinking about how uh, a lot of people reference or think about um, ideas of the English landscape, but make it contemporary. So here you have the kind of um, uh, the old with the, the cricket pitch and the village green, but then a contemporary leisure activity with this kind of uh, dance in the sky with these paragliders. And, you know, deliberately playing on this kind of dusk evening light to make this quite kind of evocative photograph. This was the Mad Malden Mud Race in Malden and Essex, which takes place every December. And it started as a pub bet between two guys who bet that one could climb through them or crawl through the mud quicker than the other. And it's now spiraled into this huge event that's heavily promoted by Malden Town Council as this kind of real cultural experience. Um, but it's also something where people go and raise money for charity. Um, and you dress up and you, you have this race around this barge in the, uh, the Blackwater Estuary. And here I've deliberately you know, taken a wider view, so rather than zone, um, zooming in to the kind of looking at the, uh, the people just in the mud, I'm taking this wider perspective, looking at the barge and the anchor, a reference to the importance of Malden as a, as a port historically. In the distance, you've got Red Row Homes, which um, its marketing literature advertised it as luxury living on the banks of the River Blackwater, only an hour from London. And this text is in, the, is in the narrative in the back of the book to tell you something about this photograph. So there's these different kind of layers of information that run through this particular frame. You know, one of the reasons I decided to shoot with a, a plate camera was that um, I was using a, a 4x5 um, ebony Japanese uh, camera, was that I was well aware that I was beginning photographing in a number of um, public spaces where a lot of people would be often on beaches or places where there might be nudity, there might be a lot of children. And so it was important that I wanted to make a very overt statement that I was there in this landscape as a photographer. I didn't want to be walking around with a small camera, you know, kind of sneaking off pictures. Um, I wanted it to be a kind of theatrical performance. There I was setting up a tripod, putting a, a hood over my head, you know, showing people that I was here taking a photograph. And you know, people got very bored, you know, you know, they'd look at me for a few minutes and then they'd carry on with what they were doing. So actually I was able to kind of very much kind of blend into the background and take photographs where nobody's looking at the, at the camera, even in places where there's a lot of people in the front of the frame, which you'll see a bit later on. Um, but also it's about really thinking about constructing 
the landscape, thinking about every element of the frame. So here, for instance, on Holcomb Beach, on the North Norfolk coastline, I've deliberately put this fence in the bottom left-hand corner. At the time this photograph was taken, the warden of the English nature that controlled the beach were trying to ban nudists from using the beach. So I wanted the fence there as this kind of little signifier that this was a uh, this is a contested landscape, and here is somewhere that there's a kind of barrier to, to some groups of people. So here, for instance, you know, you've got this kind of claustrophobic scene. This is the Cotswold Water Park, which for 60 years was a gravel pit where gravel was excavated to build houses or to, you know, for gravel or to create houses around it. Sirencester was flooded and now has become this contemporary place of leisure. So here you have the idea of the change of, of uh, landscape usage. Um, and there's just this kind of you know, rich kind of playground, if you like, of, of the English at play um, with, you know, everything from the guy with the Mohican in the bottom left-hand corner to the people with, a uh, number of people wearing socks with their shorts. You've got, you know, somebody opening a can of Stella. You've got the bins. You've got the, uh, the tents, the fire. There's a real kind of ethnographic study of, 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 the landscape, of people in landscape. <coughs> And I'm thinking about, also thinking about the kind of narrative sequencing. So this photograph in the book is, is almost like a breather. It's a kind of a, a place to pause. This is Saunton Sands on, in Devon where um, you've got some uh, surfers optimistically waiting for a wave. This is uh, Ratcliffe and Saw Power Station, with the, uh, which is run by E.ON, and this is the company golf course. These are three guys that worked at the power station for 40 years and they're now retired, but they still come and play golf three times a week uh, at the golf course. So their particular relationship to this landscape is infused with a, um, you know, one that's very much related to this period of work. Um, and I like the idea of the kind of industrial sublime. You know, this, the, here you've kind of got the, the kind of tree poking out on the right-hand side, but they've got this kind of very uh, kind of particular relationship to this kind of industrial landscape, which is very different to how we normally imagine uh, a kind of golf scene. This is uh, Blackpool Pleasure Beach, taken from a bridge over the uh, promenade. This is um, a couple that have come to the same place for 50 years to look at the landscape. Their leisure activity is one of, of, of enjoying the kind of uh, the Yorkshire uh, landscape. And they come they were saying that in the 50 years they've been coming, the only thing that's changed in the landscape is a new tractor and the arrival of those green salt bins. Um, but of course, when we look at the picture, we can see that you know, the dry stone walling, the planting of the forestry, that there is this kind of progression of change in the landscape. And I've deliberately placed the car in the photograph to, to give it a time. You know, I, want to, I don't want to make a timeless picture. I want to give it an age. I think Stephen Shaw is one of those photographers that is often uses cars in his pictures because they really give them... Uh, they date the photograph. Um, and of course, this couple have uh, sat in front of the car because they didn't want the car as part of their view. Um, so that project was, was a shot between 2007 and 2008 um, and published in 2009, again by Chris Boot. And um, again, around this time, it was very much thinking about, well, what comes next? You know, what kind of, what, what project can I do that, that will, uh, will build upon what's gone before? And rather, rather fortunately, I was um, approached by Parliament uh, to put in a proposal to, to create a series of work around the election. And um, the, the uh, cross-party committee called the Works of Art Committee in Parliament um, created this, this commission um, where they would offer an opportunity for an, a visual artist to create a series of work around a general election. And this is informed by... Um, uh, a number of uh, paintings that they've got in their collection, such as this Hogarth, where they kind of see the idea of the election and politics as actually a rich um, a subject matter for, for artists to create work. Um, and so in 2001, the commission went to Johnny Yeo, the painter, the portrait painter. And by getting this commission, what it means is, is that you get um, kind of exclusive access to the three main party leaders from the day that the election is, is called up until polling day. So there's normally three to four weeks of, of electioneering uh, when you have the three party leaders traveling around the country um, doing their, um, their canvassing. So Johnny created this series called Proportional Representation where he created a series of portrait canvases 
where the canvas was proportionally sized to the number of votes that each of the candidates got, hence uh, the large Tony Blair and the small um, Charles Kennedy. In 2005, the commission went to David Godbold, uh, um, uh, another artist based in Ireland who created a series called Forwards Not Backwards, where he produced a series of intricate drawings on tracing paper, which he overlaid on top of political ephemera that he picked up on the campaign trail as he was traveling around the country. Um, in 2010, uh, 2009, when the commission was announced, they wanted a photographer, uh, the photography to be the medium. So um, I, you know, there was a number of us that were, that were asked to put in a proposal. So I needed to think carefully about, you know, firstly about the relationship between politics and photography and look at photographers that have created work around, around elections, if you like. And of course, one of the uh, starting points is somebody like uh, William Eggleston, who created a series called Election Eve, uh, on the, um, uh, the Jimmy Carter election, I think it was 1976. And, and what was interesting about Eggleston, that all of his photographs were made on one day, and that was the day of polling where they were waiting for the announcement. So it was that kind of idea of anticipation. And actually, none of his photographs showed any people, and all, almost all of, the, all of the pictures didn't even have any overt reference to politics. So thinking about, you know, you know, different ways of trying to look at politics doesn't necessarily have to involve the, the politician themselves. Here it's just a bumper sticker saying vote Jimmy Carter president on the back of this Cadillac. Um, and then looking at kind of more recent uh, photographs such as uh, the Obama campaign which uh, prior to uh, 2009 had been you know this the, the, the big kind of world election if you like um, and probably the most photographed election in, in, in history. And what I was particularly interested in it was looking at photographs that were taken by, photo by photographers that had close access to the candidates, which is ostensibly, ostensibly what I was going to be given, was close access to Gordon Brown, Nick Clegg, and um, David Cameron. And this photograph was taken by Kelly Shell, who um, had very close access to the Obama campaign and produced a lot of photographs, a lot of kind of very good work, which most of which was published in Time magazine. But looking at the photograph, they often seem to be very positive spin on, the, on, on behalf of the Obama campaign. To some extent, they almost became um, PR photographs for the Obama. So here, you know, this is a typical photograph, you know, uh, um, Barack Obama on the campaign trail, you know, the, the family man embracing Michelle, bathed in this evening glow, you know, th pensive, thinking about what he wants to do for the American people. You've got all the newspapers spread out in front of him, showing that he's, you know, he's kind of tapped into the um, to the important issues of the, for the American people. Um, this was a photograph that published in the Times, and it kind of almost echoes that previous picture. It's, sorry about the small resolution. David Cameron and Samantha Cameron on the campaign trail. He's looking off into the distance on a train, you know, thinking about the things that he's going to do for Britain. Um, but at the same time, he's kind of relaxed. And um, yeah, here we've got this kind of gaze of um, Samantha looking straight into the camera. Uh, this picture was actually taken by uh, the Conservative Party in-house photographer, uh, Andrew Parsons, who used to work for the Press Association, got the job as the in-house photographer in 2009. Um, and all of his photographs are vetted by the, the press department of the Conservative Party uh, and uploaded onto Flickr as high resolution. So, of course, here the idea is that these photographs are then uh, encouraged to be used by the, the news agenda, you know, so that we can, you know, newspapers can download and use these pictures. And so there's a kind of gentle uh, or not so gentle kind of massaging of the, uh, the uh, kind of representation of, of, of Cameron and the Conservative Party. So, for instance, on the day that the election was called by Gordon Brown, this is a photograph that was uploaded onto the Flickr page. So he had this completely contrived photograph, David Cameron clenched fist, probably every Asian member of the Conservative Party in the frame. Um, the seat of power in the background, um, interestingly, very few women. Um, and so this was the picture that was, that, that was used by the Conservative Party. So I, I wanted to, you know, I needed to think carefully about how I could kind of push against this, if you like, and, and how I could make a series of work which was different from the thousands of photographs that were going to be taken during what would be probably the most photographed British election uh, in British history. And so I decided that I was going to take a very similar approach to We English and that I was going to photograph using uh, the 5.4, so a completely ridiculous camera for covering a, a kind of fast musing, moving news event. I was going to take an elevated perspective wherever possible so that I was, could always be behind and above uh, um, the, the news uh, uh, 
the press, if you like, so that I was always putting the photographs that we were seeing the next day in the paper in, in context of, um, of the press, but also in the context of the landscape. So that there was also an echo of we English, so that there was a, a progression in terms of thinking about the way that I was looking at the, uh, this time, the British landscape. So when the, basically what this meant was that when the election was called, I had to jump in my motorhome and drive around the country photographing electioneering. Um, and rather than just photographing the three main party leaders, I decided what I was going to do is I was going to take a photograph a day for the 24 days of the election, where each photograph represented a different chapter of what I thought would be important issues around the election. So not just about the you know, Conservative, Lib Dem and, and uh, Labour, but also look at you know, the SNP, Plaid Cymru, the BNP, uh, the English Democrats. So look at a number of the other parties that were running, but also look at issues around uh, immigration, economics, um, the, the expenses scandal. So also look at issues that were very much related to how people were going to be voting. So basically what I did was that I'd actually planned almost all of the photographs before I'd taken them. Because what I didn't want to do was, because um, the election could be called at any time. So I got, the, I got the, the commission in January 2010, and Gordon Brown could have actually called the election any time in 2010. Of course, he actually called it the beginning of April, but I needed to be ready. So what I did was I spent a lot of time thinking about the constituencies that I wanted to photograph in, but also the candidates. So prior to April, I'd already contacted a number of the, the candidates that I was going to be photographing, people like Frank Maloney, who's uh, in this picture on the left, um, so that I was already, um, you know, I'd already in some ways planned my journey around the country. So when the election was called, this was the Monday morning where I drove to Barking in Dagenham uh, in East London, and this was a photograph of, which some, in, in actual shows the mundane reality of what it's like to, to run for political candidacy for most of the 660 candidates that were running around the country for political office. Frank Maloney is a boxing promoter. He used to promote Lennox Lewis. He still is a successful boxing promoter. He decided he wanted to run in Barking Dagenham uh, against Nick Griffin uh, from the BNP. And uh, this is what he was doing on 7 o'clock on Monday morning, was sticking UKIP le leaflets through letterboxes uh, along this uh, street. And what I like about this is the, you know, it's the architecture, it's the red picket fence, it's the cars, it's, you know, the kind of people walking their dogs in the background. Um, and rather fortuitously, the election agent for um, Frank Maloney in the middle there bears an uncanny resemblance to Nick Griffin, which I quite like. Um, I'm going to show you about six of these pictures. I, um, again, I've got the publication here that I produced if you want to see more of them. Um, so the three days uh, I spent, uh, the one day I spent with, with uh, Nick Clegg was the day after the first TV debate where he became this kind of new prince of politics where suddenly people realised uh, there was a third party. And there was this feeding frenzy of the press around Nick Clegg in the uh, Tesco car park in Warrington. Um, and so in Walling Warrington? Yeah, Warrington. Um, and so here, you know, I like the idea of this kind of, um, you know, the, the scrum of people around uh, Nick, you can see him just sticking his head out on his soapbox in the distance. Um, and you've kind of got the banality of the Tesco you know, logo, you know, the so omnipresent in the British landscape. You've got the CCTV camera on the right hand side. You've got the, um, you know, the large battle bus with Nick Clegg's face. Um, this was Ed Balls in Drylington in uh, Yorkshire, playing rugby with uh, young kids from the Drylington Rugby Club. Uh, he's wearing his uh, red rosette, which uh, you can see in the print. It's a bit difficult to see here. But note the other photographer there um, in black down on the, on the grass. I'll talk about him a bit later. Um, so this is um, Gordon Brown. Um, a lot of this, this, this job was about logistics. So um, here I'd, I'd actually come to the, to the place where this, was gonna, this event was going to be taking place a couple of hours early because I knew it would be very difficult to get the motorhome so close to the... The, the event and actually it uh, it took about uh, an hour and a half of arguing with the the um, secret service of um, the Labour Party to allow me to park in this particular place because they were you know worried about um, you know me being so close but in the end I was able to to park there um, and for me this is probably 
one of the most interesting pictures from the series. Uh, up until this point, uh, Gordon Brown had not met any real people. Uh, all of the PR events of the Labour Party had been called Tea with Gordon, where Gordon would go and meet uh, with a Labour Party supporter and have a cup of tea with them, and it was heavily controlled where only one or two photographers could go in to the house. Um, there was such backlash in the press that finally the PR department of the Labour Party uh, agreed to do this uh, event where Gordon would go and meet some real people. Here, this is Rochdale. He was going to walk down this path and meet um, these ex-offenders clearing the towpath. So they set up this uh, sheet pen for the press where at one o'clock he would do this event. They'd get maximum publicity on the BBC One O'Clock News, ITV Sky. Um, here we got uh, the BBC interviewing Gordon Brown and at that moment Gillian Duffy has just walked down the street and this photograph has taken the moment she started shouting and heckling at Gordon Brown and we know that there's something going on because we've got the two other camera crews are actually filming her not Gordon Brown so there's this sense that something's unraveling you've got the guy in the foreground with a red tie giggling away um, in the picture when you look closer you've got the secret service with their earpieces this guy here you've got the guy with his gun under his jacket. You've got the nurses and the general public filming on their mobiles, so the idea that this footage is going into the public domain on YouTube and Flickr and Facebook, etc. Um, but this is the moment where it kind of started unravelling. You know? So this is the, the moment where uh, Gillian Duffy um, began heckling. And the woman next to her is Sue Nye, Gordon Brown's gatekeeper, who's just about to whisper to her to please quieten down and she'll introduce her to Gordon after he's finished with his interview, which she did. Um, and then, of course, uh, they had this, this discussion and then Gordon got into the car, left his microphone on and was caught calling her a bigoted woman. Uh, he then had to turn around and drive back to her house, uh, by which time the world's media was camped outside Gillian Duffy's house and it became this kind of huge media frenzy and, uh, and a very sad day for poor Gordon. Um, so, but for me, this is the kind of picture that sets the scene. And, and I love the detail of the, the architecture and the, the, the fences and the barbecue in the background that almost looks like a satellite that's landed in the garden. You know, again, it's this very much about this, you know, the narrative of all this kind of um, information that, that you can read within the setting of this landscape. This is um, Esther Ranson, uh, the TV celeb running in... Luton South against, on an anti-sleaze ticket against Margaret Moran, who was one of the high-profile expenses scandal candidates. Uh, and, you know, this is a kind of snapshot of Middle England. You've got this kind of housing estate, um, the, you know, the green manicured lawn and the tulips, and this couple looking adoringly at Esther as she gives her political speech. Um, and then all, the, all of the, um, her supporters wearing their Esther face rosettes and of course you know everybody's aware that I'm on the top of a motorhome you know I'm almost on top of them but there's this sense in this photograph that it's a kind of bird's eye perspective just overlooking this this kind of scene of uh, Luton midway through the election poor old Esther didn't uh, reach 10% vote so she had to pay back her, um, her deposit um, I knew I wanted to get David Cameron on polling day uh, again, it, you know, I needed to get there very early. I got, actually got here the day before, parked the motorhome in exactly the place that I, I wanted to take the photograph so that because um, I knew that the, the police would probably close the road um, before um, overnight, you know, to stop uh, people coming, uh, driving past the polling station. And then it's, you know, an element of luck because I didn't know where everybody would be standing. But, you know, climbing on the motorhome, this was the scene that I got with the all of the, you know, the TV crews in the foreground and the, the photographers in the, on the far right. You've got some of the flashes going off. And David Cameron's just walked out of the polling station. Um, I've only got uh, time to take two photographs because I'm shooting with a plate camera. So by the time I've turned the two frames around, he's got in the car and they've driven away because I can't take the picture going the other way because I'll have the back to me. So there, there was about 14 hours wait to get, to get two pictures. But you know, this, for me, this, this photograph has really worked. You've got the details of David waving. There's somebody waving in the distance. There's a woman holding up her Jack Russell dog, waving the paw of the Jack Russell. You've got a guy dressed as a chicken uh, uh, with the police surrounding him, just in case he makes a run for, for David. You've got the thatched roofs, you know, which give you a sense of, you know, this kind of upper middle class uh, constituency in, in, in the Cotswolds. You've got, but you know, the, the thing I really like is the Liberal Democrats winning here sign on the left hand side just outside the polling station which takes on a bit more significance or took on a bit more significance with the coalition 
uh, government. Um, I actually took a 25th picture because there was no um, actual result on, po on, on the day after polling day. So the 25th picture was the coalition talks, which yeah, formed the last piece. Um, as with We English, I decided that I was going to also set up a website where um, I wanted to engage with the public. Um, and I think probably this was part of the reason I also got the commission was because there was this element of, of, of collaboration. And the idea here was that I wanted, I knew that I'd only be able to get to very few places around the country over the, the 24 days that I was traveling. Um, and there'd be a number of candidates, there'd be a whole kind of, you know, a whole load of things happening that I wouldn't get to see. So I decided that, and also that election was a point where there was a huge, um, distance between the public and, and the politicians due to the expenses scandal. So I wanted to kind of engage the public in the election but through the medium of photography. So by using you know, what we would now call a kind of citizen journalist, here there was an opportunity for anybody to upload a photograph that they'd taken around the election onto this website. Um, and this website is, is, you can still go and see all these pictures. And so it becomes this online gallery which, which which takes the temperature, if you like, of the election in 2010 and gives a kind of much wider uh, a viewpoint, if you like, about what was going on at this time. Um, and this was a huge job in itself. You know, I was using uh, f Facebook and Twitter and uh, doing a radio interviews in every, every constituency I drove to. I'd call the local BBC to try and... Because I had to generate as many pictures as possible in a very short period of time. Um, in the end, I got 1,696 pictures um, uploaded. And I'll just show you a, a, a small section of them. To upload them, you also gave your name, because I wanted, uh, it was important to know who the photographer was, um, you know, for copyright reasons. I wanted to know who the candidate was, and I wanted to know where it was taken, so that actually we could use this as a kind of resource uh, in, in uh, later years. So, for instance, Caroline Lucas, the first ever Green MP. Um, what I love about this picture is there's this sense that maybe it's been staged. You know, it's almost too good. You know, here you've got this woman... Uh, looking as if Caroline Lucas is this great hope uh, for Brighton. Um, uh, and I just wonder whether, yeah, whether it was real. Um, this wasn't a co competition. I was interested in as many different pictures as possible. This was so taken by uh, somebody in Hackney on their mobile phone. Um, Sir Menzies Campbell in the back garden with this, this girl in uh, Stirling, I think it is. Um, Mandelson working his magic in Blackpool. It became interested in the, in the relationship between my pictures and the people inside my pictures. So this was photograph was taken almost the instant that I took my picture. So what we were doing, my assistant was handing out uh, cards to everybody in every photograph I was taking that had a mobile phone or a camera so that we could try and get as many pictures of people taken by people who were at scenes where I was photographing. So there became this dialogue between these kind of more objective scenes taken from an elevated perspective alongside the pictures taken within my photographs. So you kind of had this this interesting juxtaposition. And then this picture was actually taken by Ed Balls uh, in, his, um, in his constituency office. You know, so for instance, this picture relates to the Frank Maloney sticking a UKIP uh, leaflet through a letterbox. Um, there's definitely a kind of, the British humor came out uh, quite heavily in a lot of these pictures. Um, you know, PR stunts, you know, this was a, a, a brand that had created this PR stunt, you know, mimicking Mount Rushmore. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. This, the, there was an angry statement with this photograph that said that because this person lived in a safe conservative seat, in three weeks he'd not seen a politician, he'd not received any uh, political literature from any candidate, and for all intents and purposes he felt completely removed from the British political system for the f reason that he was basically living in a, in a seat that was, was, was already going to be pretty much voted Tory. Uh, Chinese hustings, uh, hustings in a Chinese community centre. Love it. Don't know what it's about. <laughs> um, the war zone that is Margaret, Margaret Hodge's campaign office. This was probably uploaded by the candidates' uh, PR office, you know, showing what great work they're doing in the community. This was Gordon coming out of Gillian Duffy's house with this kind of pained grimace on his face. Another one of my favorites. <laughs> this is the manifesto launch of the BNP. You know, the iconography and language that was used, of course, now we see at a lot of protests, I disagree with Nick. 
the more mundane uh, teller outside a polling station. And this was actually the count in Rochdale, where, interestingly enough, the Labour candidate still won despite um, Gordon's gaffe. So in the end, yeah, I, I decided to show every single picture. I didn't want this to be a kind of curated thing. I wanted to, to show all the photographs that had been that submitted. And so we, I created this 15 meter wall of photographs in, which we installed in Parliament. Um, and then my photographs were these 25 uh, prints that uh, went around various places around Parliament. And then I decided to also um, publish a newspaper because the exhibition launched six months after the election. So here, playing on the idea of media distribution, the idea that generating a newspaper about something that happened six months ago seemed like an interesting way of, uh, of creating a, a catalogue for the work. And then we also were able to publish quite a large number of them and give them away at the exhibition. And inside, there were a number of essays written about, uh, there was one written about the public's pictures, there was one written about how I produced my pictures, and there was one written about actually how the election was won uh, by um, a political journalist. Um, and I'll just kind of quickly finish, I realise we're going a little bit over time, with some of the newer work that I've been making. Um, after the election, of course, we got the coalition government and we had what became known as this kind of era of austerity and the credit crunch. So I decided I wanted to try and, having looked at the landscape in terms of uh, leisure with We English and politics with the election project, I wanted to explore you know, how uh, this kind of period of austerity would, be, would manifest itself. Um, I started by looking at a series called Star Chambers, where I spent a huge amount of time trying to get access to uh, city council chambers on budget day. So I had to write to town uh, city mayors um, around the country to get permission to take a photograph. I got permission to photograph in eight, including lead city council. Uh, and I, want, I had to photograph it on budget day because this was the day that people, that the city council was going to be agreeing the cuts, basically. So in Leeds city council, it was about 110 million of cuts um, to the budget. Um, and rather, rather fortunately, um, a lot of them were stormed by protesters. So this was actually um, uh, me photographing from the public gallery as protesters stormed and overrun the uh, city council. Uh, that was actually a, a series of eight. And then uh, carried on, this time you know, really kind of looking at uh, the kind of ideas around the landscape uh, as with the other projects. So this was Whitney, David Cameron's constituency on a Saturday, sunny Saturday morning where postal workers from Manchester uh, came and protested. So this is kind of intervention in the landscape in this kind of village, you know, this kind of pretty English village um, with these kind of, you know, the trade union banners and, uh, and uh, protest posters. And then subsequently been looking at things around like the riots. This was a warm welcome to Croydon. So this was the day after the, the riots. And this series, which was called uh, Let This Be a Sign, was in, was, uh, became much more of an installation series where I installed it in a, a gallery in Swiss Cottage Library. And the idea was I wanted to put the, the, the photographs in a gallery which was based in a public space. A Swiss Cottage has this library, has a, a, has a gallery, so it was an interesting place, you know, given that li a lot of libraries were being closed at the time um, and used a number of different ways of... Because it's quite a difficult thing to represent austerity. So, uh, I, I created a number of different series, including this montage of protest posters. I created a, uh, a fictional high street where every shop was closed down. Um, uh, this was protest signs outside the Occupy London. There was photographs in um, on bank um, trading floors, uh, and then there was a lexicon I created, a credit crunch lexicon of words that, that I collected around um, the kind of language of ec economics that we were all being, this, all these kind of words that we were being thro thrown at us on um, things like derivative, credit default swap and um, you know, austerity. And so this I basically created as, as this uh, A to Z of economic jargon. Um, and then I decided to make a series around the Olympics. And I, I wrote to the IOC a, a year or so before saying that I thought it was very important that they gave access to a photographer that wasn't interested in the sport uh, per se and was much more interested in looking at how the Olympics relates to, to London and the landscape. And for me, what I was interested in was how uh, the London, th this Olympics echoed the previous Olympics, which was happening during a period of austerity. So here you hit, had this global mega event parachuted into a city and was ba basically an economic calling card on behalf of the host city to, as a kind of global branding event. 
Um, so here we have, and Locog were very clever in the way that they use London as a, as a kind of way of selling, uh, you know, putting the Olympics into a London backdrop such as Greenwich, creating this quite um, kind of uh, interesting backdrops which these photographs would then be distributed um, around the world. And of course, in some ways I'm playing on that because I've also photographed this scene. Uh, however, I've deliberately put the uh, the, the camera in the top of the picture to, to, to give you the sense that this is a stage set, that this is a, uh, a, a kind of um, a, a created landscape to some extent. Um, and so I did a, this series of, of pictures where the, 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 the sport was always secondary to some extent. And the other thing was that I felt it was important to have these pictures just for my own archive, given that I will never see the, the Olympics in London again in my lifetime, and so I wanted to make sure that I'd got these series of photographs that um, would have some historic um, significance. And then I'll just finish with this series that um, I've just, it's my most recently published book. Um, and I, sw I suppose this, this is a, a slightly different from the other projects that I've worked on, in the sense that this is something that's just been that I've been doing in the background over the last few years. So I normally work in quite in intensive ways. I'll start a project and I'll work on it very intensively, either through um, getting uh, grants or through, through funding through uh, selling prints. With this project, it was something that actually started by a commission from a, the Saturday Telegraph magazine. Uh, the picture editor contacted me in early 2010 and uh, had seen one of my peer pictures that, I, that, that featured in We English and asked if I'd be interested in, in taking uh, a, another 10 peers around the country. So I did that and it published in early 2000, uh, in, in summer 2010. And it basically it kind of started a, a somewhat unhealthy obsession with peers. And I, I've since spent the last three years, um, whenever I was near the coast, photographing the pleasure pier. Um, and for me, it was a kind of, it was a cathartic thing in the sense that it was an opportunity just to kind of go and make something different. It was an opportunity to um, uh, have something going on in the background. But also I was interested in the fact that, that there was no contemporary study of the British Pleasure Pier, which to some extent is very much tied into the, the economics of, the, of the, coastal, the coast of Britain. Most of them were built in Victorian area when uh, railways brought people, tourists, or brought uh, the, you know, the working class to the, uh, to the seaside. And then when they got to the seaside, they needed something to do. So often they'd create piers uh, as a way of kind of promenading over the sea and being able to, you know, to, to do various things on them. I mean, there are also jetties, but th they're slightly different. So these are only pleasure piers that I photographed. And there are 58 of these things remaining. There were over 100 built, um, but due to fires, storms, and sectioning in World War II, there are now 58 left. And it started primarily as an architectural study. I would photograph them off season so that I could use very blank background lighting to really uh, hone in on the actual structure, such as this one in Blackpool. This was taken from the roof of a swimming pool, or this one in Tynemouth. But then I began kind of also photographing them related to the landscape, so you know how these things are actually related to the, to the area that they're in. So this is Saltburn, that's red car steel plant in the distance, and this is Saltburn just south. So this was built um, uh, you know, for the kind of the workers on the steel plant. They've got the old Victorian holiday cottages. Um, and here you've got the, you know, the fishing vessels coming in and people walking along the beach. So really putting them in context of the actual the landscape. And then also trying to make some more, which, more kind of figurative um, so that there was an echo of we English um, in some of the pictures. And so this has uh, basically been created over the last three years. And the only way that this project really works is the fact that I photographed every single one of them. So it becomes an archive. And in the back, of the, I used the National Peer Society to identify which were the exact 58 pleasure peers. And then at the back of the book, I've, there's a kind of glossary where there's a <coughs> potted history of every peer for those real peer fanatics. So the idea was that this is really becomes a kind of, yeah, an archive document which, which has um, some kind of added value. So I'll finish with lovely Eastbourne Pier. In terms of work I'm doing now, I'm, I'm kind of continuing uh, my kind of British landscapes survey and the idea is that I will finish that next year and will have completed 10 years of making work and I'm gonna bring all of that together in one, in one project which is a kind of 
uh, for want of a better uh, term, a kind of nation survey of, of Britain during, uh, since 2005 in, in what for me I think has been a very fascinating period in, in British uh, uh, kind of society. Um, after that, um, who knows what, what I'll do, but, um, but I hope that's given you some sense of, uh, of, of what I do and what I'm interested in. Cheers.